All right, good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to an yet another edition of SETI Talks. And uh, before I turn the microphone over to my colleague, Michael Bush, um, just wanted to give a couple of uh, announcements and some reminders. So first of all, for those of you with the, the handwritten name tags, um, if you want to, if you are able to pre-register for the talks, which you can do online, uh, we'll print up a badge like this for you, which is also then reusable anytime you're coming to the talk. So you hold on to it, keep your badge, and then when you come back in for subsequent talks, you can just walk right by the reception desk. They'll wave you through, open the doors for you. So it's a, it's a good way to facilitate, you know, getting in and also helps us not have to print new badges all the time. So uh, please register uh, when you can and hold on to your name tags when you get them and uh, they'll get you in every time. Um, also wanted to remind everybody that all of our SETI talks are on a, available as YouTube videos on uh, our own YouTube channel, which is SETI Talks, appropriately enough, and they're also accessible from our own website, SETI.org. And uh, some interesting ones that, that have happened recently uh, that you might want to check out, on August 30th, we had Gillam Anglada uh, from Queen Mary University of London. If you recall, the big story about the discovery of a terrestrial exoplanet around Proxima Centauri, and Gillam was the lead author on that paper. And we had a wonderful panel session with uh, Gillam joining f uh, via Zoom from, from the UK and our own panel, which included some people from SETI and from NASA and elsewhere. So that was a, a fun talk, an interesting one. We had a pretty full house for that and some engaging questions from the audience. You might find that an interesting one to look at. Um, on August 16th, our own REU students, the students who come and, and spend a summer doing uh, college research internship projects uh, funded by uh, the National Science Foundation, gave their so-called lightning talk. So these are the talks where they share the work they did with everybody in three-minute drills. It's a great experience for them, and it's usually a lot of fun. So you might want to check that out. On August 9th, uh, Jason Wright uh, from Penn State spoke about frontiers in artifact SETI, Waste Heat, Alien Megastructures, and Tabby's Star. You might find that enjoyable. My own personal favorite was a talk I gave actually on the 21st. It's unabashed self-advertising. Um, but it was about the, the SETI Institute to give some background and, and information about the breadth and full nature of our, of our research at the Institute. It was called Quest, the Search for Life Beyond Earth and the Science of the SETI Institute. And on May 3rd, we had a really fun panel um, those of you who are here may, may recall, we asked the question, when will we first find life beyond Earth? And we meant by that any life at all. And we had our own Seth Shostak and Natalie Cabral, who heads the Carl Sagan Center for Science at the Institute, um, and Mark Showalter, one of our preeminent uh, planetary scientists, and Fergal Mullally, who's with the Kepler team. And that was great fun. So I urge you to check those out and check out all the, the videos we store on YouTube. Um, coming up, we have some other interesting talks. So today's talk is about optical SETI, as you can tell. Um, in a couple of weeks, uh, Jerry Harp, who's uh, another research scientist at the SETI Institute, uh, will be speaking about the radio search for ET at the SETI Institute. So he'll be talking about the work we do with the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, on November 8th, we'll be talking about the history of clays on Mars, how we found them and their astrobiological importance that's again with our own uh, Janice Bishop from the SETI Institute. And a week later, uh, Ian Crossfeld from University of California, Santa Cruz, will speak on the latest exoplanet results from the Kepler K2 mission. And I know we have a lot of Kepler fans here, so some interesting upcoming talks. And then as a last uh, little announcement, um, many of you are probably aware of the radio program that we offer at the SETI Institute called Big, Big Picture Science, and Big Picture Science is a weekly produced radio program that's broadcast on over 100 stations around the country, primarily NPR stations, and also available as a podcast from our, our website, the Big Picture Science website. A wonderful general science program uh, that's hosted by our own Seth Shostak, the senior astronomer at the Institute. And we're going to be doing a campaign to raise funds for the continuation of that wonderful programming in the coming week or so. So you'll see information about that on our website and uh, some, 
some direct response appeals going out for that. Again, it's a great, great science program for all ages, and uh, we'd love to have the support necessary to continue the functioning of that program. And without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Michael Bush, who's a planetary scientist at the SETI Institute, and he will introduce today's speaker. Michael. Okay. All right. So today we have Elliot Gillum, who will be talking to us about optical SETI work at the Institute. Elliot's done quite a lot of different types of engineering over the years. Computer science at Cornell, and then a variety of scientific computing signal processing projects, worked here at Microsoft Research for quite a while. I understand you used to have group meetings in this room. So he's been here, a while. He's been here and then over at SETI and now back. And in addition to his work with SETI Institute right now on optical SETI, which he's talking about today, he's working with a search and rescue startup, which is perhaps a whole other talk he could give, but not today. Thanks very much, Michael and Bill. It's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here, back sort of at home, uh, where I spent almost 15 years, Microsoft. Uh, I have to uh, absolve myself of some uh, accomplishment. The, the Gillum you heard who discovered an exoplanet around the nearest star is not this Gillum, as much as I would like to discover an exoplanet myself. So if the clicker works, there we go. The talk today is really sort of in two halves. Uh, the first half is background and context and just to try to create a level playing field for everyone in order to talk about the instrument that we're developing, what it is, how it works, where we are, that sort of stuff. So starting from the beginning, SETI is the scientific pursuit of evidence or the lack thereof of technosignatures beyond Earth. That evidence might come in many forms and I try to tend to break it down in, in these four categories. Uh, beacons being somebody intentionally trying to contact us, interception being overhearing their transmissions or emissions, megastructures we heard a little bit about, Jason Wright and Tabby Star, uh, star of many names, Boya John, uh, WTF, KIC 8462852. Uh, it has as many names as it is awesome because it's, it's a really fascinating, unfolding scientific puzzle, uh, probably the most interesting star I know of today. And uh, I encourage you to check out Jason Wright's blog uh, or other material you can, you can find online about the developments in the observations of that uh, many named star. The last category uh, that we could probably detect uh, ex exo life would be atmospheric modification. The idea being that you have gases that are out, out of chemical equilibrium in an atmosphere, whether that's as simple as oxygen or methane or something as complex as chlorofluorocarbons or other sorts of molecules that are evidence of technology. We are now starting to do spectroscopy on exoplanet atmospheres. And so this is a really interesting field to watch as we start to discover what's going on on the surface of these remote planets and the, the implications that that might have. So the first category, what you typically see uh, when you work in optical SETI is the beacon uh, being a very large laser pointed into a very large mirror. And so we tend to think that if we can do it, so can anyone else. And so we look to our own technology to say at least that much is possible for another civilization. What we have, sort of the best state of the art, uh, close by in Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory is the Helios laser designed to simulate the conditions at the center of the sun. And so it is enormously powerful at one petawatt one billion megawatt lasers <laughs> effectively pointed at one point. Uh, if you take that and you point it into something like our largest mirror, uh, it's, for instance, the 10 meter primary uh, Keck Observatory in Hawaii, and you point that at a star, you can outshine our own sun by a factor of 10,000, and that's distance independent. <laughs> Very bright. However, there's, there's some tricks to it. One, you need this enormous laser, uh, enormous power source powering this enormous laser, firing into this enormous mirror, and that costs an enormous amount of money, at least to us. Maybe it's a high school science fair project for somebody else. But you also have to hit the target. The target's moving. Stars aren't static in the galaxy, and if, 
if you're shooting at a star that's uh, 100 light years away or 1,000 light years away, then you have to predict where that star is going to be a century or a millennium from now. <laughs> this is something that we can do today with asteroids in, in our own solar system. We, by modeling, I think it's more than a dozen parameters, including stuff like the solar wind and asymmetric thermal radiation pressure and all sorts of somewhat esoteric looking things. Uh, Michael will probably correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, <laughs> that uh, we, can, we can predict the orbit of asteroids out to about 100 years be before it goes chaotic. But that involves knowing a, an awful lot about what's going on in the solar system. You want to do this something a, a thousand light years away, you need to know about all the gravitational fields, and, uh, the differences in plasma densities, all sorts of parameters that you ha may have to measure. And you need to know them not now, but for when the beam passes through them 100, 500, or 1,000 years later. So it, uh, it's a very appealing idea, and we don't know that it's impossible. But uh, it would certainly be a very cool day that we could understand something 1,000 light years away as well as we can understand something 1 AU away. There's uh, two possible solutions to this. One, you can make the beam wider. You can just artificially defocus the laser. That makes your aiming problem easier, but now your beacon isn't as bright. Or Phil Lubin's been doing some really interesting research on extremely bright lasers that you could illuminate every target along a line of sight and just sweep it across the sky. So the next idea would be overhearing ET's communication between stars. Seems like a great idea, nice powerful communications, and they've probably colonized stars and they have to communicate with each other, uh, except that space is really just that, empty space. And so the geometry of intercepting that beam is just really bad. And unless the beams get so unreasonably wide that you're back in the category of a beacon, uh, this really isn't terribly viable. However, Kepler's really popularized the idea of observing planetary systems that are coplanar with us. And if you imagine two planets communicating with each other in the same solar system, their communication beam might wash over us once per year as, as they sort of chase each other around in their orbit. Uh, this solves your geometry problem, but it creates two new problems. One, it's such a good idea that NASA's already done it between here and the moon, and it only took 500 milliwatts to generate more than half a gigabit of bandwidth between here and the moon. Now, granted, the moon's pretty close as far as things in the solar system, but we're still talking really tiny power sources that would be very hard to hear over 100, 1,000 type light years away. Second, if what you're communicating with is a planet or a moon, then prob it probably absorbs the entire beam and there's nothing you know, flying past it for us to catch on the far side. So it would probably only work with sending to spacecraft like the kind we have. Really exciting announcement earlier this year from the Breakthrough Foundation was uh, Project Starshot. The idea is to send uh, a spacecraft to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, four light years away. By having an extremely low mass spacecraft at about one gram and hitting it with a 100 gigawatt laser for 10 minutes, uh, they want to accelerate it to 20% of the speed of light so that the trip will only take 20 years. This is a very appealing idea for SETI, uh, but it, it, it comes with its own difficulties, obviously. You have to construct the 10 million 10 kilowatt lasers. You have to also construct the beam so that the spacecraft stays within it. This illustration is nice for showing the concept. But when you notice the beam doesn't actually go around the spacecraft. And as anyone who's ever tried to stand on a soccer ball knows, uh, convex shapes aren't all that stable. And so what you probably want to do is have the beam be wider than the spacecraft and indeed have the most powerful part of the beam on the outside so that if, as the spacecraft naturally moves around, there's a potential minimum in the center and it stays in your beam rather than just falling off to the side. Nature provides opportunities for lasers as well. Uh, turns out carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on Mars is as excited to be on Mars as I would be, except it emits 10 micron radiation, which is about the same uh, type of radiation that we emit in terms of body heat. If you took some mirrors and put them in orbit, you could bounce back and forth between that optical amplifier and create a very powerful laser that's pumped for free by the, by the sun. This is kind of the lesser known cousin of stellar masers where ionized hydrogen gas 
produces coherent radio emissions at a particular temperature. Nature also produces lenses of a really excellent quality, and billions of them. Uh, relativity says that, light, that gravity bends light, and so a star forms a lens. The only problem is, uh, it, going back to that interstellar interception problem, now you have three points you're trying to line up, and so your geometry problem just got way worse. It would, it would work great, but it would be extremely rare and, and extremely transient as, as you got the exact right alignment. You can use the, your own local host star, however, um, but there's some difficulties in that as well. Our own star doesn't start to focus light until 542 AU, which is about 14 times farther than Pluto. Uh, in addition, you're in orbit around the sun, and, so, and you can only look in the direction of the sun. You're looking around it as it, as it focuses, and so you would see the same, the same spot once every 12,600 years Great lens, but it's, it's not, not terribly reusable in a sense. Last, I think it's really important to talk about what we don't know, and that's basically uh, everything we do know about ET is essentially that we don't know anything. Uh, we know that physics is universal by definition, but we also know that we don't know all of physics. Uh, we know that they would have a different environment and therefore a different biology, uh, a different, different history, a different technology would have de developed from, from that and their motivation for using that technology would be different. The implications for SETI are tricky to discern. We don't know if they'd be incredibly advanced and extroverted and want to talk to us, or maybe they'd be so advanced that we simply wouldn't perceive their, their existence or their technology, or maybe they'd just be as interested to meet us as we are to, in, to study one of the millions of species on this planet that we have yet to, to study. Uh, the point here being that the implications for SETI are, are really unknown, that, that it could be really good what, what ET is doing for finding, finding them, or not, and we don't know the answer, and it's really sort of dangerous to hang too much on speculation about what ET might be doing. It's great to say what they could be doing, but the real answer is we really don't know, and, and the best thing to do is investigate. So to kind of summarize the, the different contact scenarios, uh, communication interception probably just doesn't work so well, but beamed energy propulsion looks really promising. They could build a, a really powerful beacon like we have with, with Helios and Keck if we pointed the two at each other and apologized to everyone in between. Uh, and uh, gravitational lenses seem like an interesting possibility if, if you imagine them having greater spaceflight capability than we do, and maybe they can use their host star reasonably. I've graded the, the Mars carbon dioxide laser and the unknown sort of in the middle. Uh, we'd have to use different detectors for the carbon dioxide laser, and it's just impossible to figure out the, whether, whether the unknown is good or bad for us. Next, I'll go through some of the factors in doing a SETI search. The first obvious question, and I get surprised, asked surprisingly often, is, is life even out there? And this is a really good, important question, uh, and I think it's it, it relates fundamentally to SETI, the, the, the importance of the work we do in finding an answer to the question and doing so scientifically by gathering evidence. I think most scientists would agree, however, that uh, the evidence is leaning in a certain direction. What we found in the last, I don't know, 40 years uh, is, is an array of, of evidence that, that sort of points to the idea that simple life may indeed be pervasive. We found organic molecules, you know, obviously not just on planets, but in the vacuum of space they get formed. We found that wherever life takes hold, it's extremely tenacious and can live in high acidity, high salinity, uh, the vacuum of space, high radiation, extremely t tenacious. Uh, the Kepler mission famously recently found that there are more planets in the galaxy, in the universe, than there are stars and something like 20% of them may be Earth-like. And in our own local neighborhood, uh, robotic exploration has found that Mars both was and is far more habitable than, than we had imagined. And beyond that, three of the moons have some pretty interesting potential for harboring life as well. Intelligence may be something else, though. 
If you look at the history of life on this planet, it took over three billion years just to go multicellular, much less self-aware. Uh, beyond that, the great potential of intelligence may imply great instability, and there may, may be a low survival time for intelligent civilizations, or they may evolve so fast that they quickly become un unrecognizable to us. So personally, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously going to wait until the, the evidence is in, and that's, that's my goal. But personally, I think the, the real question is not, is there life, but is there intelligent life, and if so, will we ever find it? So what are we looking for when we do a SETI search for, for communication signals? In the optical, we tend to look for monochromatic signals. Uh, this is good because nature doesn't produce these, and lasers, which are incredibly useful for solving a wide range of problems for a civilization, do. Traditional optical SETI searches also tend to look on the nanosecond time scale because relativity, again, bounds the, we, we think there's no natural sources of nanosecond pulses in, the nat in, in nature. And the other factor is that a star viewed from a distance, a star like ours viewed from a distance of a thousand light years only produces a photon once every thousand nanoseconds, and so the background is, is quite low. In the radio, we again look for narrowband sources. The narrowest we're, we know of is a maser, and it's 300 kilohertz wide. If you look at our spacecraft, uh, the Voyager, for instance, not exactly our most technically advanced spacecraft, has a bandwidth uh, 5 kilohertz wide, almost 100 times narrower. We also look for the Doppler shift in those signals for the uh, the motion of the Earth as it goes around its orbit. And of course for both of them, we look for them to image to a point in the sky, and ideally we observe them either interferometrically with a long baseline or with multiple observatories so that we see it from the same point in the sky from different locations. It helps to rule out false positives. For those of you up on your space news, you'll have heard about ESA ending the Rosetta mission last week by crashing it into Comet 67P. Fortunately, nobody was there to take that picture you know, one nanosecond before it hit the, the, the comet, uh, but we did use the ATA to tune in to the last broadcast of, of Rosetta before it hit. You can see on the right side there, the carrier uh, frequency is at 1.936 gigahertz, and those vertical bars uh, are spaced 25 kilohertz apart. You can kind of see in the green plot, you can see it in the red plot pretty easily, the data sidebands of, of that communication signal. And given the 25 kilohertz scale, you can see visually that, that that's a very narrow band transmission. We naturally tune our transmissions to be narrow band. So a slide on some relatively simple concepts, but at the same time, really worth making ex explicit and separate. Um, one is, is the idea that when you have two equally likely alternatives, it's both natural and logical to choose the easier one. The low-hanging fruit doesn't taste any better than the fruit further up. But contrast that with the streetlight effect, also known as the drunkard's search. Uh, it's a funny parable about a, someone with impaired judgment looking for something he lost, not where he lost it, but in the streetlight because it's easier to search there. That, again, one would contrast with uh, practical constraints of reality and physics, and perhaps the most important constraint, funding. I think Yogi Berra would say you can only do what you can do. So where and when do we look with telescopes? What I've done is to take some of, the, some of my favorite searches and show the, the fields of view of those searches. And you can see uh, two of them have a field of view about a third of a square degree. One of them is much smaller than that. Now, uh, for those of you not familiar with this, a square, square degree, the sun and the moon are about half a degree wide and therefore take up an area of about a fifth of a square degree. And the sun and the moon are pretty big, but the whole sky turns out to be 41,253 square degrees. So clearly there's a lot of ground to cover and it take a long time to, to paint the sky with, with the narrow beam. That is exactly what they did in that third search. They covered the whole northern sky, but it takes them about one like one year to complete that whole uh, coverage of, of just the northern sky. Doing that, they have about 48 seconds that they're looking at any given point. That's great, but that also means there's 364 days, 23 hours, and 59 minutes where you're not looking at that point, and 
then the signal could arrive then. So given the fact that the sun has more than 100 billion, sorry, the, the ga galaxy has more than 100 billion stars, 18 million just within the 1,000 light year radius, which is that yellow dot that represents us on that picture in the galaxy, um, and that the most optimistic estimates, uh, quoting Carl Sagan, for the, for the number of intelligent civilizations in the, in the galaxy is a million, that means only one in 100,000 stars would have uh, technology. Again, quoting uh, Carl Sagan, famously said uh, and correctly said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And SETI searches have kind of a long history of producing wow signals, interesting signals that never repeated and weren't compelling enough uh, to stand on their own as, as evidence of another civilization. Uh, just a month ago, many of you might remember the, the Russians at the Rattan 600 array uh, announced a very interesting signal and then soon after realized that it was just local interference and retracted their claim. Uh, it turns out that uh, radio interference is very difficult to, to filter out in order to confidently identify the source of a signal, uh, particularly the more sensitive you are. And if you're not explicitly set up to do this, then you're very likely to get fooled by pretenders. Uh, one of my favorite SETI researchers said that his least favorite SETI result is a bunch of maybes. So we've talked a bit about radio and optical as if they're only two things, but they're, everyone knows they're on a continuum of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The reason we do this is that since most of us are constrained to work on the surface of the Earth, we're under an atmosphere that absorbs at certain frequencies. And there's two main windows of transparency in that atmosphere, one in the optical and one in the radio. So comparing the two, you can see that optical has much, much smaller wavelength at billions of a meter versus you know, on the scale of a meter. And because the size of a beam you can make uh, is related to the, the wavelength, uh, optical, tele optical beams can be focused millions of times more narrowly than radio beams, even with a smaller aperture. You can see there the comparison between the Keck telescope uh, and Arecibo with its much larger uh, dish. Planck's constant relates the energy of a particle with its wavelength, and because uh, op optical energy has such a shorter wavelength, that means it has a lot more energy. So for a given amount of energy, you get many fewer photons. This means that in the optical world, we, we sometimes talk about counting individual photons where the radio uh, regime is, is, is what we call classical. And uh, part related to that is, is why you get RFI, that signals bounce around in funny ways and you, you can detect things from the side when you thought you were looking straight ahead, that sort of stuff. And also the propagation through the galaxy, through the interstellar medium, is different for the different particles. Radio waves get dispersed spectrally, uh, whereas at long distances, and particularly at shorter wavelengths, optical light gets absorbed. Turns out the interstellar medium is made up of particles about the size of the wavelength of, of visible photons. So you might ask, why don't we use infrared if shorter wavelengths are bad? Well, the answer is we are using infrared, and I'll talk about that later a little bit, but that's uh, emerging. Those, those technologies aren't as mature uh, as the visible technologies, and the atmospheric windows are not as, uh, they're more spotty and sporadic. <clears throat> so with all that context, I wanted to explain a little bit about what the SETI Institute has already done with the Allen Telescope Array and what makes it so unique. Uh, it's, it's an array of 42 six-meter dishes, and LNSD stands for large number of small dishes. Those small dishes means it has an unusually wide field of view, and we just heard about why spatial coverage is really important. Be being an array, it can use interfer interferometric techniques to reject interference. Uh, we talked about the atmospheric windows, and you can see the radio window in the bottom right there. Uh, it's called the terrestrial microwave window in the literature. And uh, that green region is, is that the best part of the radio spectrum. And indeed, the, the ATA's wideband feed covers the entire thing. Many, many radio telescopes don't cover the entire radio window, or if they do, they have to mechanically swap in different feeds, and they lose a lot of efficiency if they want to try to do that while they're pointed at a particular target. 
The SETI uh, Institute's ATA also spends the most time dedicated to SETI observing per day at 12 hours a day, and it's the only one that has real-time analysis of the signals. To explain why that's so important is probably the biggest eye chart, but also my favorite slide probably because I can quantitatively back up the claims of uh, efficiency and, and credibility of the signals found. In six years of observing, uh, the ATA found almost 300 million signals. We were able to uh, discard two-thirds of them immediately because we track known sources of interference, and so we simply did, didn't follow up on them. But then, because the, because the array is automated, we're able to do immediate follow-up and reobserve uh, signals that weren't known interference. And as you see, the successive reobservations keep eliminating things that, that don't show up uh, as we look at, at the right point on the sky, all the way down to one signal out of 300 million, just one. Uh, there are not many, too many times when my experience here at Hotmail over in uh, Building 4 uh, overlaps with, with my work at, in astronomy at SETI, but uh, this one I think overlaps in two ways. One, having such an enormous complex system able to be run by less than one person is extreme efficiency in, in people time and cost. And two, uh, when you operate as, at extreme scale, you get to see things that nobody else ever gets to see. And here, this is essentially, to me, this is a measurement of one in 300 million signals is going to fold a computer and it's going to take a human to go, oh, okay, no, that's also interference too. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty cool measurement that you don't get to do unless you spend 19,000 hours having built a, uh, a radio telescope and looked at 9,300 9, stars, 2,000 of which had planets, 65 of them in the habitable zone, and covered the entire terrestrial micro, a microwave window with it, Microsoft window. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'd encourage you to check out, we just published a paper uh, detailing these results, and so if, if you're interested in, in more about this, uh, Jerry Harp is the author, and it, it's a really great paper. So in the late 90s, the, the SETI Institute gathered a, a group of preeminent scientists, visionaries, and engineers to define a roadmap for what SETI as a whole should do for the next 20 years. They literally wrote the book. It's called SETI 2020. And you can buy it on Amazon, and I recommend it. It's a good read. Uh, in it, they made three major recommendations. One was the one hectare array. And if you're wondering what the heck a hectare is, it was an attempt to replace the acre with an SI unit. It's 100,000 square meters, or about two and a half acres. Uh, it didn't seem to catch on. You might recognize from the picture, however, that it looks like early designs for the ATA, because that's exactly what the ATA was trying to do. While the ATA has uh, essentially fulfilled all, the, all of its other design criteria. You heard about all the things it can do. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're running at one-eighth of the collecting area, and we'd like to build out the rest of it to, to get that 100,000 square meters. They also recommended optical SETI, and indeed, the SETI Institute and other scientists have gone this direction. In fact, if you look south towards Lick Observatory, that's where a number of uh, famous previous and current optical SETI experiments are running. Uh, the uh, automated planet finder is there, and Shelley Wright has a really cool project where she's starting to, uh, called Nero SETI, where they look in the near infrared for SETI signals. The last major recommendation they called OSST, about looking at the whole sky all the time. This is a great idea, but it, uh, they thought that they were, it would be in the radio looking at one to three gigahertz, and looks like out of the three recommendations, that was the only part where they were wrong. Looks like we might get to it first in the optical. So we've talked a lot about the dimensions of SETI, but I thought it was useful to kind of clump them up and talk about them all at once. I think of there as being three aspects of time. One is the, the calendar date that the signal arrives. Two is the length of time that that signal persists. And three, if it repeats, how often does it repeat? Many different time scales possible for that. Assuming they're using photons, what wavelength would they, would they use and what wavelength would we receive it at? What power would it be transmitted with? And the two dimensions of where on the sky we would see it and the third of how far away it would be. And then there's kind of the meta dimension of would it come from a star 
would it come from a star that's so far away that we don't see the star, but we do see the signal? Or would it simply not come from a star? Maybe a spacecraft, colony ship, something like that. We simply don't know. Halfway through the talk, I'm going to get a drink of water. It might be a good time to stretch. Start talking about the instrument. OK, first thing any good team member does is acknowledge his team. In my case, is particularly important since my background's in computer science. Uh, I, I definitely wouldn't be here if it weren't for the incredible help of this team. I have the pleasure of working very closely with Jerry Harp, uh, Lawrence Doyle, Peter Jeniskins, Frank Marchese, Sesh Ostak, <coughs> and uh, Jill Tarter have all been extremely generous with their time. And uh, we wouldn't be here today without Alan Holmes. And uh, Adam, Jean, and Zoran have also provided some invaluable assistance. So as any good engineer knows, you're doomed to failure if you don't have a good prioritized list of goals and requirements. So we started with the idea of covering all the sky all the time. And that breaks down, of course, into the spatial coverage aspect, as well as maximizing the amount of time that you're looking at the sky. That means you need a very rugged, low maintenance design. It's got to be very cheap per hour if you're going to have a whole lot of observation hours, uh, and, and obviously highly automated. Uh, we talked about uh, how thousands of stars have been examined on short time scales, and so we think it's interesting to look for infrequent signals and therefore have a very long observing campaign where you could see something repeating once a year instead of once a millisecond. Uh, we look for monochromatic light using spectroscopy, and I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, we keep the cost low by having a wide field of view, and we uh, get that duty cycle of observation up by doing continuous readout and essentially never closing the shutter. Uh, we want to have really high confidence if we're going to claim something interesting. And so the false positive target I've set now that I've uh, done some of the analysis of the initial data is to have a statistical false positive less than once every 1,000 years. And keep in mind, that's analyzing da data at a rate of a million, 13 million billion pixels per day. We limit the, the requirements to only trying to, the, the minimum to detect the signal essentially and uh, hope to do more detailed characterization with traditional telescopes that have you know, higher spectral resolution, that sort of stuff. Our spatial resolution is about a 40th of a degree, about 1.4 arc minutes. The spectral resolution is about 30 nanometers and the time resolution is about one millisecond. So before we get into it, I wanted to provide a little bit of background because particularly TDI tends to throw a lot of people for a loop. And so if, if I lose you on the TDI part, uh, you're in good company and uh, don't worry about it, you'll still get the rest of it. Uh, first, however, just a little bit of background. I hope everyone uh, knows this Pink Floyd album. It's a really great album, I recommend it. <laughs> but it's also uh, reminiscent of Newton's experiments with optics where a prism takes white light and splits it into a rainbow because different colors bend at different angles. Monochromatic light bends at only one angle, and so it remains a tight beam as it passes through a prism. Gratings do the same thing, except they produce many spectral orders at the same time. We'll get into that, how we use it in a second. A TDI is the thing that, like I said, is probably going to hurt your head, but uh, I wanted to do my best to, give, uh, to explain how the instrument works. So, it's a CCD readout technique where you accumulate light and then you shift the charge down a row and then accumulate more light. The accumulation is called integration. And so you delay and integrate, shift, delay and integrate, shift. This doesn't make a lot of sense until you think about trying to image a moving target. If you picture something like a satellite flying at 17,000 miles an hour over the Earth, you can see maybe why uh, you might want to match that shift rate to the rate that the Earth is passing underneath you, and then you can produce this nice, clean, long strip of an image. It's also used in manufacturing when you have, have things passing underneath a, a camera for quality assurance or something like that. So the logical diagram of the system is really pretty simple. There's a grating at the top to split the light spectrally, a lens to focus the light, and a camera to measure the result. With an extremely wide field of view, 
there's no point in having one of those expensive tracking mounts. We just bolt ourselves to the ground and let this guy drift over. It's called drift scanning. Now, if you got me with TDI in the last part, this is, this is where it gets even a little gnarlier because we use TDI wrong. We don't produce a normal looking image. What we do is we clock the TDI out as fast as we possibly can. What that does is smears everything out vertically, just basically kind of smashes it all into one row. The reason we do this is we take the star, we're taking the starlight and spreading it out over the entire CCD effectively, but short pulses don't get spread out. They still image as, as, a, as a single point. This gives us time resolution and allows us to handle the dynamic range of the sky better because if we saturate parts of the CCD, then clearly we can't detect any additional signals on top of that saturated part of the CCD. But now we've lost the y-axis because we've smeared everything out vertically. So what we do is we take a second camera, point it at the same field of view, but turn it 90 degrees sideways to get the same effect in the other dimension. That gives us additional statistical confidence. Now we have four spectra, two from each camera, uh, and we can match up the events in order to recover full XY coordinates of the event. So two out of our three components are off the shelf. The lens we're using is a standard SLR lens. Uh, the 24 millimeter focal length means it's a uh, very wide field of view combined with the large CCD. Uh, you can see our field of view there is about 72 degrees across. Uh, we chose Canon, Canon lens uh, because of the high quality and ability to illuminate uh, that, that large focal plane. The camera, however, is, is quite a bit more specialized. Uh, we use a camera from Finger Lakes Instrumentation, a company in upstate New York, that uh, is an astronomy grade cooled CCD. The cooling turns out not to be super important because we don't integrate for that long, uh, but it's good for having a stable platform essentially to calibrate. And um, what, what they, besides being a really great CCD for being large and, and high quantum efficiency with the, the ability to convert photons into electrons. This camera also supports this TDI mode that I talked about, and it does it fast. In fact, they've even given us custom firmware to make it go even faster to clock this thing out as fast as we can. And I have to say that, that the, uh, the camera is just really nice to work with. You know, the best way to communicate it, I found, is it, the, the shutter kind of has that luxury car door sound. It just, the, the, it, just it's a, it works really well. It's kind of that... Uh, yeah, special, special high quality feeling you get. Uh, so this isn't just theory or specification, but I thought you might, you guys might appreciate seeing this thing in the flesh. So you might recognize the camera down here at the bottom. The lens is in here. And then the grating is this big piece of glass that sits just in front of the lens here. Then there's a hood that keeps, keeps any ambient light outside of the field of view from scattering into the camera. If you look closely, you can kind of see the, the rainbow effect of the, of the grating um, on top of the lens, but uh, this is it. Uh, one last question, one last thing that I tend to get asked by everyone who sees that is, was all that stuff on top of the camera 3D printed? And yes, it was, <laughs> and 3D printing is really easy and really awesome, and I, I recommend it if you're at all inclined. So what do you see if you look through this camera? It's kind of a logical diagram. Uh, you can see uh, two stars. There's the zeroth order, the single dot in the center, and then the grading is optimized to produce the plus and minus one orders and maximize those. <clears throat> the hotter star, uh, you can see the light concentrated towards the blue end of the spectrum. And the cooler star, you can see the lights kind of concentrated towards the red end of the spectrum. The monochromatic pulse is what we're looking for, and so it shows up as just two dots. And uh, the location of the pulse where it originated is in the center, and the separation is a function of the grading and the wavelength of the pulse. So let's see, K 
can you click the movie up there? Uh, just to give you a sort of a good idea of what it, what it looks like as the sky drifts over the camera. You can see stars moving. You can see airplanes uh, flying through the field of view. There's some clouds. And if you look, for instance, in the, in the top part right now, you can see those two spectral lobes with the zeroth order in the center. But as I said, we don't use normal full frame imaging. We use this TDI smearing in order to look for signals. Here's a test we did with a higher resolution grading and some LEDs. <clears throat> you can see that the LEDs were firing at a regular interval, hence the e they're evenly spaced vertically, but they're different colors because the horizontal spacing of the, of the colors is different. And anytime you build a sensitive instrument, you're also going to detect a bunch of things that you're not interested in detecting. And it turns out we detect a lot of cosmic rays and radioactive decay in the optics. And so these are what is sort of the, the what, what causes the statistical false positives in the system. You can see they're, they're kind of random, but uh, with, a, with a random distribution, once in a very long while, they're going to appear the right distance apart and, and might fool us. Airplanes, satellites, uh, other, other things are much more easily discriminated against because they don't look anything like the, the dots. The way the algorithm works is it first looks for simply power above the noise level. Then it looks for the dot, for something that's a dot being a short pulse less than the one millisecond time resolution or a nearly vertical extended pulse lasting more than one millisecond. It, it can be slightly not vertical because the stars can shift horizontally through the field of view. So, but that's, it's very, I think it's like one pixel in uh, 50,000 or something like that, that it's allowed to be not vertical uh, as we clock out the, the CCD so fast and we have such a wide field of view. Then we combine these things by looking at how far separated they are. They can't be too close or too far. Uh, and they also have to have an even amount of power between them. As you saw in some of the previous ones, some of them are, are bigger than others. <clears throat> we can rule those out. Then the last thing is to look across cameras. And because the first two stages can produce a statistical false positive, probably on the orders of once a day, um, when we combine cameras, and since the data rate is so high, that's where we get our biggest bang for our false positive reduction. And two cameras takes us from once a day to once every 10,000 years. And that's just two cameras. This is how we lay out cameras on the sky. Uh, a node is half of an observatory because we've got two cameras per field of view, one twisted 90 degrees. Uh, we're showing four cameras as sort of the minimal way to cover the 120 degree field of view we want to have but maybe we'd want to have five uh, in order to get a little more complete coverage. Then laying out the observatories on the Earth in, a, in an optimal way is a little bit tricky because the, there's only land in certain places. Fortunately, uh, there's a reasonable layout of these things. Uh, the, the six minimal observatories, three per hemisphere required to, to cover the sky once uh, we have in the red dots here. <clears throat> also laid out secondary observatories, which aren't strictly necessary, but have some really cool benefits that I'll talk about in a second. That is basically uh, three different things. One, more cameras is just more statistical confidence. You saw how we go from a day to 10,000 years. It, it goes on even better from there. Uh, that's the least interesting of them. Second, no observatory has perfect weather, so if one's clouded in, the other one might not be, and so we can significantly boost the amount of time that we're watching all patches of sky. But my favorite is a physical validation of the signal being of astrophysical origin. Because the, the, there would be a path length difference between the two signals, we can measure that time delay, compare it to the angle we observed it at, and add that to our statistical confidence to say this was a real signal that came from this direction, this point on the sky. We'd love to partner with universities or potentially private citizens for hosting these things. And there's some really cool work we could do putting it, it's trivial in fact, 
to put the camera on a larger aperture and have a smaller field of view, but more sensitive, look deeper into that field. Uh, and it would be a fun additional project to slave that system to the main system. And any time we saw something, slew the telescope over and, and sort of zoom in and study that patch of the sky. Because who knows, maybe the, the signal comes in for 10 seconds at a time, and you want to observe it more, and you could get there in time. Um, right now, you heard about the heuristic pipeline we have. But it'd be interesting to develop a machine learned pipeline and, and do a, maybe more of an unsupervised classification rather than enforcing the criteria that we know. And there's some cool secondary science we might be able to do. Uh, doing meteor and space junk surveys, or being able to quantify how often it happens, distinguish the two, looking at um, maybe even the 3D composition by the, by the burn rate, being able to see it burns in first in one element and then in a different one because we've got some spectral resolution. So of course, the right way to run a project, particularly a SETI project, is transparently. It also surprises me how often people ask, if you found something, would you tell anyone? <laughs> and uh, I just, it's, it's mind boggling to me because of course you would. In science, you don't know anything unless somebody else can also reproduce it and validate your, your methodology and results. So uh, we would, of course, make the, the metadata pu uh, publicly available, the image samples, the raw data, because I mentioned 13 petapixels a day. That would uh, obviously be limited to uh, available funding. Uh, and uh, the code is already on GitHub. We'd love to work with scientists, astronomers, citizen scientists, uh, and even students and universities to see what sort of uh, value they could add, ideas they have, ways they could improve the system, or be part of an educational campaign. So broken the project into four different phases. First is obviously a whole lot of researching and prototyping and coding that we're now completing to build that first camera system. Uh, I'm now doing the analysis of, of the data in order to be able to tune the thresholds um, and, and be as sure as we can with as little data as we have right now with the false positive rates. The next thing to do is to take multiple cameras, as I described earlier, and run them to validate the co-observing strategy. Then build one observatory, or maybe paired observatories, in order to start gathering data uh, at a reasonable rate to truly understand the, the global system false positive rate. When you, when you have one of a thing, it's very different than having 100 of a thing. Everything happens 100 times faster. And so before you go and put a million dollars worth of hardware around the whole world, you might want to validate it a little more locally. And of course, the last and maybe most important thing I'm doing is trying to find the funding in order to buy the hardware to test out these, these ideas and, and code up. So in conclusion, one property that I think is, is really easily missed about observing all the sky all the time is normally when you're looking at a particular point in the sky, you have to be sensitive enough for the signal that you might be lucky enough to receive looking at that point in the sky at that time. But looking everywhere all the time, you automatically see the brightest signal ever to wash over the Earth during the years of, of observing. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, phenomenon, and it's not just theoretical. Uh, something called fast radio bursts have sort of come to the fore recently in the radio astronomy community, which is very bright uh, but distant pulses, uh, millisecond, that only last a millisecond, and we think they might be happening 10,000 times a day, and we've essentially missed them for the whole history of radio astronomy because we didn't happen to have the telescope pointed at the right place at the right time. Uh, so. Whatever ET is doing, if it's bright but intermittent, all previous and current searches very likely won't find it. And that's why we want to look at the sky all the time. Thanks very much. All right, we have some time for questions. And I'll run around with the microphone. Um, very interesting talk. I especially like the. Um, uh, pictures of candy bars you had in the background a lot, but water on um, Mars. I'm uh, surprised that you focus on such an incredibly small false, false positive rate. Um, other things being equal, you're sacrificing sensitivity to, to do that. But a simple follow-up procedure would let you um, 
be able to accept a much bigger false positive rate. So I must be missing something. No, it's, it's really two things. So the, the noise in the system is, is perceptible. And, and based on the current false positive analysis, that initial power threshold, I've been able to drop from a signal to noise ratio of 10 to 1 down to 5 to 1. And I think that still is quite acceptable. Uh, might even be able to go a little bit lower, but obviously you know, can't go to 1 to 1. Um, second, the, I think we don't know whether the, the signal will repeat. It's, it's sort of a traditional assumption that the signal is, is not just repetitive, but continuous. But if you look at some of the scenarios where, where maybe it repeats once a year, or maybe it doesn't repeat at all, we'd like to be able to have that higher confidence. With the hardware being as cheap as it is, and with trying to get that coverage, um, we think it's worth having that additional confidence uh, that you could justify more follow-up and, and, um, and be more confident in what you do find. So um, thinking back to your favorite slide with the uh, false positive signal rate dropping off, I noticed that, uh, that uh, I think it was the last automated pass seemed to cut through like about five orders of magnitude in terms of uh, false positives and earlier passes, um, you know, seemed to have a different rate. And I'm kind of curious like what the, um, uh, like what you think is uh, leading to that being a little bit uh, un ununiform. Uh, that question would probably be better answered by, by Jerry. My guess is, it just has to do with um, the persistence of uh, interference signals, that maybe that's the time it takes the satellite to fly overhead or the airplane or something like that, that, yeah, it's not, it's not exactly the same amount of drop off every time. Hi, uh, at the very beginning, you uh, stressed the importance of uh, photon counting in this field especially in the nanosecond regime, because essentially lasers give out energy impulses. Unfortunately, you've chosen a detector, which is an integrating detector, and does not count photons. There's loads and loads of photon count detectors, CQs, image keys, etc. The world experts are just located 40 miles up the road in that place called Berkeley. I was just wondering why you're not photon counting. Uh, it really comes down to field of view. Those detectors are quite large, as I understand them. Isn't that good? Uh, it is, but then that requires a, a much bigger optics. Big and, and if you want to have a wide field of view, that makes your optics problem much worse. But you want a big field of view. Yes, we do. So you're arguing against yourself. We're arguing against ourselves. Yeah. You think that, yeah. Doesn't that mean you need a large, more curved piece of glass, more, more mass? Now when we want to put them all around the world, <laughs> it, it, we need 100 of these things. Then it, it's, it's all about cost, actually. So the answer is not, I don't want that. The answer is, what we've done is try to engineer the project to be the minimum, and we're here in Silicon Valley, the minimum viable product. If, if we can, if we can go, go bigger, we'd certainly like to do that. So it's, it's not really a question of, uh, of not wanting to do that. It's a question of, rather than starting from the sensitivity and saying, can I get one, we want to start from everything and then see how big we can build it. That's the problem in our yeah. Yes. We'll take the money if somebody's going to and deploy the bigger optics to the Go ahead. Oh, OK. Uh, I noticed that the camera is about the, the same form factor as a CubeSat. And you've got uh, a couple holes there, North Pole and South Pole. I'm wondering if the, uh, uh, there's some thought to actually putting these uh, in space uh, at some point to, to cover that area. Yeah, I have actually, much like larger optics, I, ha I have actually thought about it. That would be really cool. Uh, that would be, uh, but it's really just about cost. Uh, you, I thought about, could you kind of just launch that? And of course, you'd have to do the normal outgasting and other sorts of tests, and th there'd be some engineering just to do that. And then, you know, what sort of control and communications is, is required? It'd, it'd be some significant reengineering. Yeah, yeah. It, 
as, as it, as it I, you can't probably tell as I'm holding it, but it's really quite heavy. So I'd have to say at $10,000 a pound, uh, it'd probably cost a quarter million, no, an eighth of a million dollars <laughs> just in launch costs, but, but I would love to do it. Okay, we are out of time, so if you, we'll have, if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one for more questions after, please do come up, and we will have lunch downstairs. And we will give Elliot the traditional thank you for our speakers. <laughs> Thanks very much.